Hi there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss with the final segment in our series on score reading. Here are my recommendations for getting a good start as a score reader. This list is for beginning score readers, but that doesn't mean that the works are simple or straightforward. Far from it. Each score provides a challenge and has great artistic interest, historical significance, and some new feature about orchestration or instrumentation that you can learn. Everything seems to begin with Bach, so let's start with him. are an amazing collection of works. Six concertos ranging from two to four movements each for all different combinations of instruments. You have to remember that at the time that Bach was writing these concertos that um, instrumentation was somewhat free. Um, the violin, viola, and cello had basically just been uh, created in their final form and people still had a lot of instruments like viola da gambas and what we call recorders now. Also, um, for a bass, oftentimes instead of what we think of as our normal double bass, they would use a thing called a violone, which is a sort of a viola da gamba with, I don't know, anywhere from six to eight strings. So these works themselves uh, contain all of those types of instruments, which are today played by regular orchestral counterparts. Uh, typically, a viola da gamba part will be played by a regular viola or a cello. Even though the instrumentation for these concertos is widely varied and you can learn a lot about basic orchestration uh, in combinations with trumpets, flutes, horns, and so on and so forth. My favorite is the third Brandenburg Concerto, which has groups of three violins, three violas, and three cellos. It's just really an amazing work. I, I love to listen to it. I, I really enjoy it and I, I've learned a lot about it writing for strings just uh, from this one concerto. Now, just as Bach's Brandenburg Concerti will teach you some basic stuff about scoring and um, about how to have series of instruments doing soloistic parts, against each other, and of course a lot about um, early Baroque writing and scoring and thinking. The Mozart wind serenades are like a model lesson in good writing for winds. Every movement is just a different, remarkable piece of art. Um, and there are all sorts of beautiful things about this um, to notice. First of all, notice that this is um, for a group of winds with horns. The bass is played by uh, probably just, you know, a, a, a double bass. They say that there's an option of contrabassoon, but most ensembles that I've heard use the contrabass. There are oboes as the top voice, rather than flutes. Another thing that I really love about this is that it uses the basset horn, which is this amazing contralto clarinet that is um, in pitch. It's a little bit below the regular clarinet and a little bit above the bass clarinet. And it has just a wonderful, uh, rich, uh, deep sound, which is, it's not uh, bouncy and slightly creepy like a regular bass clarinet. Um, it just has this wonderful mellow sound. And 
Mozart writes a lot for it in this serenade, so you can you know, you really see how you might score for that instrument if you ever had an opportunity. Third on our list is Mendelssohn's Overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream. This was written when Mendelssohn was only 17 years old and he actually had created a body of work, uh, chamber music, uh, written a symphony by that time, so he was actually a very experienced composer by the time he did this, despite his young age. And I feel that it kind of quantifies everything that is unique about classical scoring. There are bits of Beethoven's approach in it, there are bits of Mozart's approach, and of course Mendelssohn's own unique approach that he was developing as well. If you want to learn a lot about um, the way that classical music was scored, there's no better piece than you could study, I think, um, with, with the exception of one, which I'll talk about at the end of this segment. Now, for a contrast, this piece, which was written only about two or three years after A Midsummer Night's Dream by Hector Berlioz, Symphony Fantastique. This is such an enormous leap forward in, uh, in music, in orchestral thinking, in orchestrational technique. It's just simply a remarkable piece of orchestration and should be studied by every orchestrator. This symphony is unique in that it tells a story. Uh, no symphony had ever done that before. And it also had just remarkable uh, scoring for brass and for winds and um, used them in a completely different way than it had been before. Um, check out this excerpt from the last movement of the symphony and, um, and see just how everything works together to create this foreboding, this massive expressionistic exercise. Now, I've been recommending that people read a string quartet uh, or two just to really learn a lot about string writing. And the one that I'm going to recommend the most would be the Ravel String Quartet in F. I really admire Ravel, and, and a lot of orchestrators do, uh, for his amazing abilities to put sounds together in the most elegant way. But a lot of this is based on his approach to writing for strings, and I, I mean, I can't think of another string quartet that has as many different effects and, and as, as many different approaches uh, that sort of are all bound together with uh, such such grace and such listenability. Mm -hmm. 